All right, uh, we're going to get st started. Thank you for coming, everybody. It's uh, great to be in Tokyo. <laughs> so uh, my name is uh, Sunny Rajgopalan. I work for PlumGrid. And today, I'm going to be talking about uh, building a scalable federated hybrid cloud. The way I'm going to structure this presentation is that uh, I'm going to start off by, by talking about a few use cases for what I'm calling the multi-cloud. And I'm going to talk about what a multi-cloud is. Then I'm going to move to what I believe is a, a scalable way of making a multi-cloud manager that can manage this, uh, this kind of multi-cloud. Then I'm going to end with a demo to prove that uh, the, uh, the stuff that I'm, I've been talking about is not just uh, theoretical, but it actually works in practice. So let's say that you're in a situation where uh, you have to deal with the complexity of managing more than one cloud. Now, uh, this could be a mix of uh, public and private clouds. Maybe you've got uh, more than one private cloud. Uh, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's, a, it's a mix of, of proprietary CMS and maybe OpenStack. So there's a, uh, you're trying to uh, deal with uh, uh, you know, this, this whole mess that you've got. So let me see if I can figure out this uh, remote. Well, I'm just going to go with this. All right. Oh, you got the joke there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So th uh, if, you, if you're in the situation, you might find yourself asking, how did I get here? Or if you're not here already, why would I want to get here? Now, if you were to ask your friends and family about this, they'd probably give you an answer that, uh, that sounded like this, that maybe it's because you just don't like having a social life, you know? Or, or maybe it's because you love complexity. <laughs> or this is the idea of fun. Now let's, okay, let's leave the jokes aside and let's look at uh, what real use cases are for the, uh, for the multi-cloud. And again, again, there's, there's a word again, I said multi-cloud again without explaining what it is. I'm, I'm using the word multi-cloud to just refer to uh, a situation where uh, you are responsible for managing more than one cloud. That's, that's, that's it. So the use cases for the multi-cloud are, as I call it, nobody builds a multi-cloud just for fun. So let's say that you've got an app that only runs on a certain kind of a CMS. I've, take, I've, I've uh, given a few examples here. Uh, this is all hearsay. Uh, so maybe uh, you're running SAP, uh, or maybe you're running uh, Microsoft Exchange or SharePoint, or maybe you're trying to run uh, Halo in multiplayer mode, and it's only certified to run in Zen. Maybe you need more than one cloud for disaster recovery. And uh, why, why, why did you set up two clouds uh, like this? Because you, sir, are smart. You know that uh, one day, this is going to happen to your data center. And then everybody is going to be talking about how smart and how, how much foresight you had to have created a backup uh, cloud. Maybe you're trying to reduce costs. And uh, this is actually something that we hear often from customers as well that uh, uh, they're running a proprietary CMS, it's uh, really expensive, and when the CFO thinks of you, this is the image uh, he has in mind, which is not that great for uh, job security. So uh, you've been hearing about OpenStack, and uh, you've been trying to figure out if you can move some of your workloads onto uh, uh, your OpenStack cluster, uh, and uh, m maybe do it slowly over time in such a way that people don't really notice. So you want to see if you can pull this off, you know, being able to migrate to a, maybe a lower cost CMS. Maybe you're trying to scale. Now by scale, I mean at least, uh, at least 200 compute nodes. Uh, you know, maybe 1,000, maybe 2,000, maybe even 5,000 compute nodes. Now uh, you, you may ask, uh, now why on earth would anybody need a cloud that's uh, that big? And uh, I don't know, maybe you're trying to achieve world domination. Now, the, the question here is, even if you were to believe uh, the published numbers of your CMS vendor, even if your CMS vendor promised that uh, they can scale to whatever number of uh, uh, nodes you're trying to get to, the question is, do you really want to put all of your eggs in one basket? Uh, because when the controller for that one cluster goes down, you're basically taking down your whole uh, 1,000, 2,000 node cluster along with it. So just from, uh, uh, from the perspective of having a smaller blast radius, what you should probably do is uh, combine maybe a bunch of smaller clouds together 
to make your larger cloud, that's probably a better way to structure your, uh, your cloud needs. Yet another use case uh, we hear about all the time is that uh, you're a company which is uh, geographically uh, distributed. And uh, what you want to do is, is connect your clients with uh, the servers that are geographically closest to them. Now, this is usually achieved using something called a GSLB, uh, which for those of you who are not familiar with it, is just a fancy DNS with, uh, with some load balancing characteristics and with some health checks built in. So the way a GSLB works is that when it receives a DNS request, it, uh, it checks where the client is located and then it responds with the IP address of the server that's geographically proximate to the client. So what this means is that uh, you could uh, set up your, your two clouds in different parts of the world and you can connect the cowboys with the cowboys and the Indians with the Indians. So let's say that you, you, you want to also uh, do non-disruptive upgrades. And uh, again, because you, sir, are smart, you, instead of making this as just one big cloud, uh, you made it as a, uh, you made your uh, deployment as two s uh, smaller clouds which are connected to, to each other. And now time passes and then uh, your favorite CMS releases the, the blue software and uh, you really love the color blue and you really must upgrade your cloud to the blue software. So how do you do this? It's pretty easy if you've uh, set up uh, your clouds this way. All you have to do is migrate your workloads from one cloud uh, to the other cloud. You upgrade uh, the cloud which doesn't have any workload right now to the blue software, and then you migrate your VMs back. And there you go, you've got uh, a cloud running blue software and you're happy. Maybe you've got many things in your IoT. IoT is also a buzzword that you hear uh, these days a lot. IoT just means Internet of Things. And uh, what, what we're really talking about here is that you've got, uh, so unt until now things were hard enough where you had a physical data center and all you had to deal with was uh, pesky employees with laptops who were trying to VPN into your uh, physical data center. But now we're moving to a world where uh, your, uh, your, your, you know, your, all of this stuff is in the cloud. And it's not just employees with laptops that you need to be concerned about. You have to be concerned about things like, uh, uh, you know, the temperature sensors or power meters or rainfall sensors. All of these need to be put together to form one giant uh, uh, cloud. So how, how, do you, how do you manage this? Now, uh, before I get to this, there, there are a few more use cases that I haven't talked about because, you know, really there, there, are, there are many use cases for having a multi-cloud. You know, people talk about cloud bursting, for example. That's, that's where uh, you, you, ext you tr uh, treat the public cloud as an extension of your private cloud so that when the, uh, when the load uh, g given to your, pr uh, to your private cloud exceeds its capacity, you can extend into the public cloud. Uh, and then there's also uh, some companies which, which like to do what they call a follow the sun strategy. So if, you, if you've got uh, customers spread all over the world, you can uh, turn on and turn off clusters uh, around the world depending upon the, the usage and depending upon the time of the day. So if you're still asking yourself the question, how did I get here? Why do I have a multi-cloud? Or if you're trying to figure out why am I trying to get here and you don't know the answer yet, it means you haven't been paying attention. All right, so let's talk about uh, managing your cloud, or as I call it, how to, see, how to keep sane at scale. So this is where I, uh, I, I admit to, to something. I, I, this is where I admit to having a little bit of a bureaucrat in me. Uh, so I love documentation, for example, and that's a very strange admission uh, coming from someone who works for a startup. So when I look at uh, a multi-cloud, the, the things that I worry about are how do, I, how do I know what's going on in the cloud? How do I figure out what the status is? How do I, how do I monitor it for defects? And uh, you know, if something goes wrong, how do I troubleshoot it? These are things that you could worry about if you've got more than one cloud. Uh, how do I do inventory management? Now, you, you all heard of this thing called uh, NFE, and NFE uh, has what they call VNFs, which is uh, basically specialized VMs. You know, they, they call it VNS, but uh, you know, they need a, a term for it. It's, uh, and uh, you know, you, if you've got all of these clouds, you're gonna have VNFs with different software versions, and you need to keep track of what's running where, and what versions you've got, and, and uh, maybe trigger upgrades with them when the time comes. Maybe, uh, maybe you're running OpenStack Hilo in one cloud, and you're running OpenStack Liberty in, in another cloud, and you wanna be able to keep track of this in a, in a single pane. Then uh, you've got to worry about global policy and configuration. 
so uh, for example if you set up a policy that uh, the engineers should never ever uh, be able to talk to the marketing people which is maybe a good idea you want to be able to apply that across all of your clouds then metering and billing this is something that keeps the the bean counters of your company very happy they need to know they they obsess about things like your uh, your link utilization and your uh, and your cpu utilization and how much bandwidth you're consuming you need to be able to meter all that and bill it so that you can you can do capacity planning for the future as well now uh, you also need to be able to do uh, things like event based cloud uh, cloud uh, migration so uh, may maybe it's is based on time of the day maybe it's based on a, a catastrophic events maybe you want to switch between the clouds and uh, you really don't want to be the guy who who, who gets woken up at 4 a.m to do this manually so you want to be able to to automate a lot of this as much as possible so w one way in which uh, uh, the actually the uh, one of the only ways that you can keep sane at the kind of scale that we're talking about is by the use of templates and the idea here is that uh, you make uh, you make patterns out of uh, uh, out of out of common deployments and common applications and uh, you once you, you once you define the pattern for what your application is going to look like you then instantiate that pattern many many times so uh, the idea is uh, define once and then uh, you know instantiate many many times so for example maybe you built an, an application for world domination yet again and uh, you know you could instantiate that into all the clouds you built all over the world to achieve world domination okay now let's talk about uh, uh, an architecture of the multi cloud manager there's there's another ki uh, buzzword out there which i just uh, uh, slipped in what is the multi cloud manager i'm assuming that if you've got a multi cloud you'll need to have some kind of software to manage it that's what i'm calling as a multi cloud manager that's all there is to it how do you do the magic so another question is okay there's so many controllers out there sunny why don't you just use an existing controller that's a good question even though nobody's asked it yet it's because uh, this is coming this is the this is the these are, these are all the things in the internet of things I don't know if you would want to put uh, make your uh, your bike internet accessible but I'm assuming at some point it will happen regardless of whether you want it or not. So uh, you need to be able to scale to millions maybe even billions of of endpoints. And you need to be able to manage uh, not just hybrid clouds but even things that don't look like clouds. So if you if you want to be able to add your uh, uh, your electricity meter into your uh, your private cloud if that doesn't look or feel like a cloud how are you going to do that you know so controllers are not uh, really built for that kind of thing so here's here's some thoughts on how not to screw this up if if you're going to try to make uh, this kind of multi cloud manager number 1 is uh, to be a manager not a micromanager what that means is that uh, make the clouds do the heavy lifting so if you've got a multi cloud manager that's managing a set of clouds you want all the heavy work to be done by the clouds themselves you don't want to be in the position where the multi cloud manager is doing anything heavy and, uh, and uh, as an example of that i would say don't go to the multi cloud manager to validate keystone tokens okay so this is uh, uh, let's let's put that down and say that we are not going to go to the multi cloud manager to va validate keystone tokens or to handle ARP responses, or to do, do DHCP allocation, none of that stuff. All of that stuff needs to be done inside uh, your respective clouds. You do, however, use it for configuration management. You need to be able to support multiple backends, and, uh, and uh, this is an OpenStack conference, of course, but OpenStack uh, for a multi-cloud manager should just be uh, another backend. So it needs to have a kind of plugin-based, pluggable uh, architecture. So if you've been listening to me uh, so far, you probably think that uh, uh, I'm uh, I'm now going to urge all all of us to let's go make a controller. Well, here's what the timeline of making a controller looks like. We would spend the next two years writing the platform for the controller. We'd spend another two years making it highly available. By that I mean making sure that when uh, portions of it crash, that uh, that that doesn't take down everything. We would take we would take another two years making it scale. So this is what it looked like today, okay? It's it's not a very flattering picture, but that's that's what I have. So six years of working on a controller will do this to you. <laughs> okay, so so let's not make a controller. 
Okay, now let's let's talk about whether uh, uh, you know is there a solution? So okay, uh, Sunny, you you said that you don't want to use an existing controller. We shouldn't be making another controller. So how do you solve this problem? Well, yes, there is a solution to this problem. I'm coming to that. You know, and you use them every day. They scale to millions of users and billions of endpoints. And uh, maybe some of you already guessed this. Yes, we're talking about web applications. Okay. The load balance, the auto scale, they can be distributed geographically and they still play nice. Plus, the good thing about web applications is that you can build one in just a few weeks. Imagine if you were trying to make a, a, a website uh, to sell Star Wars memorabilia and you told your boss that uh, it would be ready in six years, you'd be laughed out of the room. You know, and the good thing about uh, building the multi cloud manager as a web application is that anybody with web application development experience can work on it. You know? You know how hard it is to find somebody with experience in working on any one of your favorite controllers? It's very hard. It's because uh, you know they, they're, they're very proprietary and they've got all these uh, uh, very uh, unique. Uh, they, each of them is a special snowflake, you know. So we need somebody who understands uh, that particular snowflake. Whereas for web application, there are armies of people you can find who know how to uh, modify this and to add uh, features to it. So this is what uh, I thought I would do. I thought I would uh, do an experiment and uh, write the multi-cloud manager as a web application. And I don't want to worry about the platform. Why? Because worrying about the platform is a trap. It's a very costly trap. Because uh, now think about this. When, when you want to write an app for a mobile phone, the first thing you think about is not, uh, let me write an operating system for the mobile phone. You know, you just pick a platform that you like and you, and you go with it. You know, the same thing goes with, the, with, let's say, Linux. If you want to write an application that goes on top of Linux, you don't build your own Linux distribution. You just pick Ubuntu or whatever best suits your needs and you write an application on top of it. But we are still stuck in this world where people, uh, you know, uh, constantly want to write their own platform for, uh, for, for solving these needs. There's, there's no need to solve every distributed computing uh, problem that has already been solved since 1980. I know it's a lot of fun. But you don't have to solve it. There's no, there's no money in that. So I decided to just use a PaaS, which is a platform as a service, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the acronym. And the question is, which PaaS to use? There are a whole bunch of uh, uh, PaaSes that you could uh, pick from. Uh, you could have gone with uh, Cloud Foundry or OpenShift. They're both very good options. There are also commercial PaaSes like uh, Google App Engine and Amazon's Elastic Beanstalk. Uh, for the multi-cloud manager, I actually went with a non-intuitive choice. I decided to do it in uh, Google App, App, App Engine uh, APIs. Uh, the, the reason is that, uh, I, again, I, I could have picked any one of the passes. It, it would have, uh, you know, any one of them could have uh, done the job. The Google App Engine is one of the oldest passes. It's been around since, I think, 2009. That's the first reason. And the other reason is that uh, there's an open source implementation of uh, Google App Engine APIs called uh, AppScale. And that's also been around since, I think, uh, either to, uh, 2010 or so, which is pretty mature. What this lets you do is that it, it lets you take your application, which has been written on uh, uh, using Google App Engine APIs, and run it on any cloud, private or public. So you can run it inside uh, your, uh, uh, your OpenStack cloud, for example, or you can run it as, as a hosted service in uh, any of the public clouds. You can even run it inside EC2. So this is the architecture of uh, what I'm calling the multi-cloud manager. There are a lot of uh, confusing looking rectangles in here, but this is just, a, again, remember, it's just a web application. It's written on uh, using a, a web app to framework, but that's just because that's the default framework that App Engine comes with. Uh, you, you could have picked uh, Django or Node.js or whatever your, your favorite uh, framework is. It doesn't make a difference. Uh, the, it is, it's lo logically split into a top half and the bottom half. The top half offers a RESTful interface to the rest of the world. What it does is that it gives a generic object model of all of the objects in your universe. So it gives like a, an archetypal uh, server, an archetypal s uh, storage unit. Uh, you know, it gives, an, uh, it gives an object model for your switch or your router or your device. And uh, uh, when you want to configure any of these, you talk to the top half of uh, the multi-cloud manager, which receives these as REST requests. And then the multi-cloud manager looks up the flavor of the zone uh, that this target device is on and schedules the right bottom half. And the, uh, what that means is that 
uh, you schedule the right bottom up plugin and they could have an OpenStack plugin or an IoT plugin or a physical router plugin or an AWS plugin. Today we already have an OpenStack plugin and an AWS plugin. What this does is, is take your, your, your generic object model and uh, it talks to the target using APIs that the target understands. And uh, this is this whole thing is encapsulated inside uh, the the pass. So the, uh, the, the 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 platform APIs are just whatever uh, App Engine provides. Now, because this was done using a pass from day one, uh, the the multi cloud manager supports su a load based auto scaling. It has a distributed database backend. It's got memcache. It's got a web based interface for viewing and monitoring database contents. It's got channels to uh, to send real time messages. And uh, and I got all of this in uh, in a sense. Almost for free. I didn't have to write a single line in the platform. It just came because these are these are features that uh, App Engine provides. So this is what the interaction model of uh, uh, MCM looks like. Basic idea is that uh, you go to MCM and and, uh, and tell it that uh, please apply this configuration. Now uh, uh, the top half of of the multi cloud manager takes that and then uh, uh, passes it on to the right bottom half handler. The uh, bottom half handler uh, speaks the right set of APIs to the targets and makes it happen. And uh, if you look at the examples here, there's, there's a reason I have these, uh, these specific examples. Your, uh, you could use this, for example, if you are, uh, let's say that, that your OpenStack cloud has Open Daylight as the networking plugin. And Open Daylight has this, has this ability to, uh, to connect to uh, another Open Daylight instance in another OpenStack cloud over an MPLS backbone. Now, uh, uh, as long as this feature is exposed uh, through APIs, this is something that, uh, that the Mata Cloud Manager could configure for you. And the same thing is uh, for uh, an OpenStack cloud running uh, PlumGrid as networking plugin as well. So uh, if you're running PlumGrid as a networking plugin, we, uh, we have the ability to to connect to other Plum Grid plugins on other OpenStack clouds using VXLAN or going over the internet, or or even peer with uh, AWS using uh, uh, IPsec and BGP. So all this can be set up uh, using uh, MCM. So let's go back to, to the question that uh, uh, we we brought earlier: that how do you protect your cluster from Godzilla? So the uh, so the first thing is, of course, you need to have a, have two or more of your clusters. If you just have one, then you know there's, there's nothing you can do. Now, uh, remember, I spoke about M about MCM templates. What you need to do is is templatize all of your uh, your configuration and then apply your templates to the two or more clusters that you, that you've got set up. Now, when you've done this, this means that your configuration is is basically identical across all of your different clusters. The only thing that you don't have to be concerned about from an MCM perspective is the replication of application data. And that's because uh, uh, you know, uh, most databases can be set up to do remote replication. So that's not something that the, uh, the MCM needs to be actively involved in. And, even, uh, you know, and that's probably not a good idea for it to be involved in either because this is high volume stuff and you really don't want it to be transiting MCM at all. And really, really, why, why would you do this? The, the databases do, a, do an amazing job by doing uh, remote replication anyway. So uh, again, we are still following the less is more approach where, where we try to do as little work in the multi-cloud as possible. So uh, this, is, this is an illustration of what I just spoke about where uh, I have I've packaged all of my configuration as templates and I'm passing it on to the, uh, to the top half of, of uh, MCM. I said I've, I've labeled this as active, active or active standby clouds. Now, uh, it, and I've got two clusters out there which are which have been synchronized using the template instantiation uh, mechanism of uh, Multi Cloud Manager, and uh, the databases have been set up to do remote replication. Now, whether this is active, active or active standby, just depends upon how you're steering your client traffic. If uh, your client traffic goes to both of these clusters, then you would call this as active, active. If your client traffic is only going to one of these clusters until that one goes down and then you switch it over to the other cluster, then, uh, then you would call it as active standby. But, but really, that's, uh, that's just how you configure your uh, load balancer. So uh, this, is, this is what I already spoke about, that the apps are responsible for synchronizing runtime databases. And then once you've got all of this set up, when the day arrives that uh, your cluster gets caught in the war between Godzilla and Mecha Godzilla, and uh, the cluster on the left goes down, you're still good because uh, your configuration was already persisted by a multi-cloud manager. 
you know, your application database was already synchronized. And uh, about how do, you, how do you do the switch? That can be done using either, either the GSLB or a load balancer. Uh, but, yeah, both of them have got health checks built in, so that if one cluster goes down, usually it'll know, yeah, and you know, and then it's able to uh, switch over to the other cluster. All right, so let's let's talk about the identity management, or uh, how to do authentication and authorization in uh, in this in this big new world. Now, here's a before I launch into this, I have to I, I have to give this warning. This stuff is very boring. There are a lot of details, and I'm going to try to distill all the details down into a couple of slides, but it's, pro it's probably still too much information. Uh, y you know, let's, let's see how we do. <laughs> so that's a lot of words. See, th that itself means that there's some complicated stuff going on. Basically, the authentication and authorization is done at the periphery of the cloud. So when you talk to the multi-cloud manager, then you uh, then at that point you uh, do uh, you authenticate the the user making the request. You check to see if he's allowed to do what he's trying to do, and then within the cloud itself, everybody uh, you know the all the el different elements of the cloud talk as privileged users. So it's basically the the idea here is that you secure your perimeter, and then inside uh, they talk to each other as uh, as privileged users. Now uh, the MCM can use any uh, can use an external IDP. Today we've got support for uh, for all of these actually OAuth, SAML, LDAP. Uh, so uh, you know it can uh, it can interface with an external LDP, which is with an external IDP, which is a good way to do this. You really don't want uh, you know your multi-cloud manager to be in the business of uh, of cycling user passwords and checking for password strings and things like that. You've already set those policies for your organization. Uh, you know you should just leverage that uh, out here. So I'm going to I'm going to walk through uh, the the steps needed in server creation, and uh, to, just to illustrate some of the points we talked about earlier, this is probably where some of you are going to start to zone off. But I'm going to I'm going to do this anyway since uh, it looks like I might have a little bit of time. Uh, so the the uh, the call to create server comes into the top half of MCM. So uh, MCM then redirects the request to the IDP from which uh, MCM gets the user in the group associated with that user. So the IDP is responsible for, uh, IDP for those of you un unaware are, is, is the identity provider. That's the, that's, the, that's a module that you go to for, for authenticating an, an end user. So that you come back from the IDP with the user in the group. Then there's an assignment module in which uh, you then assign the the user in the group to a role in a, in a tenant or, or a domain. And then uh, you finally check the authorization policy to see that, uh, to check to see if, if that ro a role is allowed to, uh, to has access permissions on the object that it's trying to access, access or modify. Once all that is done, this is what I was talking about, uh, authentication being at the periphery. Now the bottom half talks to the, the, the respective uh, the respective targets uh, as uh, as a privileged user using tokens, and then the rest of it is uh, uh, is just usual OpenStack stuff. Yeah, that probably wasn't really very clear, but just come talk to me later. <laughs> okay, that's just in time for the demo. Let's now uh, prove that uh, what, uh, what I just sold you wasn't uh, a bag of uh, manure. Okay. So a bit of introduction of wha what I'm showing out here. So I've got uh, I've got two uh, I've got two clusters out here. One is an OpenStack cluster which is running uh, PlumGrid as a networking plugin. But again, going back to what I said earlier, that is not uh, that is not important. It could have been ODL. In fact, uh, one of the clusters could uh, didn't even have to be OpenStack. But for the purpose of this demo, it's there's one cluster r running. Uh, you know, there's one OpenStack cluster running uh, PlumGrid networking. The other cluster is uh, AWS. And what I'm going to do here is using the uh, multi-cloud manager, the, f the federation manager is just uh, uh, the, the name we use internally for it. 
using uh, the multi-cloud manager, I'm going to connect these two. I'm going to get these two to peer. Not just that, I'm, o I'm also going to set up uh, servers on both the sides. I'm going to set up the networking on both the sides. And I'm going to do all of this using templates. So you can see how uh, templates is, are a really powerful mechanism for, for bringing up your applications. So, So this is a recording. My apologies, I couldn't do this live because I wasn't sure if uh, we would have connectivity to AWS. So what we're doing out here is uh, just making sure that yeah. So what we're doing out here is uh, is telling a uh, multi-cloud manager about uh, the uh, about the zones, about uh, what the flavor is, and how to c how to connect to them, etc. Uh, you know. So and this w what you what you're observing out here is. Uh, a Swagger interface. This is not the UI for the multi-cloud manager. We are still working on the UI for it, uh, but uh, the Swagger is a great way to exercise the APIs, uh, you know, in a UI-like fashion without actually resorting to scripts. So uh, we uh, there you go. We just uh, we, uh, we just told uh, first we set up the OpenStack cluster with uh, uh, with MCM. Now we are setting up the AWS cluster, as you can see. We just called it AWS Santa Clara. That's the name that we gave to it. And this is uh, th this is the plum grid UI to the uh, OpenStack cluster. It sh it tells you that there are no networks. There's, no, there's nothing configured here at, at this point. It's just uh, uh, you know it's 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 empty. Uh, we've uh, uh, we've told uh, MCM about it, but we haven't yet yet configured anything. So. Let's go ahead and do that now. And uh, these are the other templates. I'll just give, giving an overview of uh, some templates which which were already set up, and we are going to now uh, instantiate these uh, these templates. By template instantiation, again, what that means is that you take a, a template that already exists and then uh, you publish it to a target. This is uh, this is similar to Heat. But also different in the sense that uh, heat requires you to, uh, for for every uh, target that you want to use in heat, you need to make a backend in heat. Whereas uh, the templating mechanism in in MCM is more uh, general th than that. It doesn't require you to uh, to uh, you know create a, a a target backend for every every everything that you want to create a template for. It's uh, it's it's more general than that. Uh, there, there you go. You, you just we just in instantiated the the networking template, and uh, now you see that over on the plum grid side, this is uh, a pretty complex topology that we've made. This is, uh, uh, I guess, we are, we are not showing the OpenStack view of this, but uh, uh, but that's that's yeah, a mixture of switches and routers uh, that you see out there. All right, so now we're going to go and instantiate uh, another template. If I'm not mistaken, this is the. AWS uh, networking template. Uh, let's see. All right. No, that that is that was probably the the server template. Yeah. We so we just launched a VM using a, a yet another template. You see the the image name out there. That's the. Uh, so we just launched a server using the template. All right now. All right, we just uh, created a VPC, again, using a template. And uh, the, the the VPC with the long name that you see out there, uh, there's a certain syntax to the name. You know, it has the operator name and the tenant name and the region name, et cetera, et cetera, in the, in the, in the path for that. Uh, but uh, that, that that one with the long name out, th out there is the uh, VPC that we just created, again, using uh, templates. Right, pr proceeding along, we just uh, launched an instance using a template. Let's see if it's getting spawned out here. There you go. There's, a, uh, there's an EC2 instance uh, that just got spawned again using uh, using an MCM template. 
Now this is the, the dynamic router out on the networking side and these are the routes that it has. Now all the IP addresses you see here, a, it, there's a 1.0, there's a 2.0 address. These are all IP addresses which are in your, on your OpenStack side. So at this point, this is just to illustrate that you, know, you now have your two clusters and that's the IP address of your uh, uh, VPC, it's, it's 10.30. So you, you now have two clusters which are isolated from each other. They're not connected to each other yet. You just created uh, the networking side and the compute side using templates. Uh, now, now to prove that uh, the two of them aren't connected, we of course have to do a ping test because uh, how else will you believe me? There you go, it doesn't work. All right, okay. So now let's try to connect these two clusters together. And we'll do that again. By coming here, we're going to create uh, what we call as attachment points. Oh, before we do that, uh, let's let's see the uh, look at the route tables on the VPC side. Uh, yeah, those are the routes. That's just the 10.30 route that you saw earlier. There's no there's no route for the OpenStack side. So the OpenStack IP addresses, you know, the 1.0 IP addresses and the 2.0 IP addresses, they're not there on the VPC side yet. Of course, because we haven't connected the, uh, the two of them yet. So now what we're going to do is uh, we're going to create this object called an attachment point on uh, on both clusters. We're going to create an attachment point on the uh, on the OpenStack cluster, and then we're going to create an attachment point on the VPC cluster, and then we're going to create a link between the two of them. And the idea, obviously, is that once you create a link between them, it's uh, you know the two of them going to be able to talk to each other. So that's us creating the attachment point. And an attachment point, if you use, it's 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 like appearing a D. Uh, it's a, it's a place where others can come and create uh, connect. You saw some BGP ASN information out there. That's because uh, uh, you know uh, Amazon. It to, to peer with Amazon, you need to use uh, BGP and IPsec. So uh, when you uh, you know when you're when you set up the, this connection, you need to uh, you know make sure that the information is consistent on both the sides. So now we are creating the attachment point again on the Amazon side. All right, that's done. Now we need to create a link between these two attachment points. So remember, I mean, this, this, uh, uh, we, we've, we've gone through the whole gamut of, uh, you know, bringing up your whole application, uh, setting up the servers and the networking and, the c and even connecting two clouds together in the, c in the course of this uh, uh, short 10-minute uh, presentation. So it's, uh, it's really not that involved. We just giving a name to the link and uh, telling it what's in what's in both sides of the link. Okay. So now, now let's see if, uh, if we had any magic. Now coming back in here. You'll now see that uh, we've got a couple of tunnels set up. These tunnels are necessary for your uh, Amazon, your AWS uh, uh, cluster to peer with, uh, with OpenStack. And all right, what are those IP addresses there? 1.0, 2.0, those look very familiar. Those are from your OpenStack side. And now let's look at the routing table on OpenStack side. Again, we're looking at the routing table of the dynamic router here. Ah, there's a 10.30 IP address which wasn't there before. And that is the IP address of your VPC cluster. So now that both sides have exchanged routes and you've got connectivity between them naturally, let's check if ping works. What is the IP address again? 230, yeah. Okay, so. So now we, we've now connected uh, to 
two classes together using MCM. All right. So uh, b before I came here, uh, uh, my five-year-old son asked me to show him uh, the slides of this presentation, and uh, I quickly went, through, went went over them, and then he asked me, "Papa, why do you have Godzilla in your slides? What do you want people to learn?" So, all right. So I have to answer that question. Wh uh, if if wh what should your key takeaways from this be? One. Uh, you don't necessarily need a controller for solving all of your problems. You know, try to use a web application if you can. That's it. All right, thank you, folks.